moving right along, I'm going to delete all of this. And I'm going to apply um, one more kind of post-processing, or I shouldn't say post-processing, multi-pass rendering technique for you guys. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to, after all this craziness, I'm going to add a scene rendering pass. Now what this does is it actually pr provides a completely independent, separate render of the scene to a texture map for you that you can use in any other way you see fit in the entire scene. So, how is this useful? Well, I'll show you. If you wanted to, say, shade the entire scene in 3D with a custom shader and then use that result in a post-processing pass, you could do that, and I'll show you how. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a shader, just a normal old shader, called... Um, what do I want to do here? Um, I'll call this shift, and I'll explain why. What shift is going to do, apart from leaving everything blue, now I'm going to load it from a template, basic texturing, load. So what shift is going to do is essentially turn off lighting, for starters, and it's also going to do something a little weird, which is essentially take the position of the vertex on the vertex shader, and in object space or model space, shift the Y position up of some arbitrary amount, like 10. And essentially everything that's been rendered with the shader is going to be moved up by 10. Ten's too much, let's do one. One was too much, I guess. 0 0.01. So I'm just going to dial this in. This is something crazy just to show you guys what this does. So basically what I have now is I have something that moves this. I could be a little bit more interesting here, and I could use time to make it oscillate up and down. <laughs> that looks ridiculous because I scaled it by too much. Okay, all I need to do is multiply this by my same old 0 0.01 and multiply time by something a little bit faster. All right, so there we go. It looks like an earthquake, which is actually pretty cool. Now, I actually don't want to apply this shader at all during my normal rendering pass, so I'm switching it back to font. Now, here's where it gets interesting. If you guys remember, I created a scene pass here. Well, this allows me this special little option called the override shader. And if I set an override shader, essentially what I've done is now every single object, every mesh being rendered by the entire scene pass over here, will be rendered using that shader instead of the one I have set. And now, when I add a post-processing effect, I'm going to combine both the main rendering pass and my quake rendering pass into one rendered result. And this is basically going to be the finale of this video, because this is going way long. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit this. I have my pass input texture, which is from main. One is going to come from Quake. And I'm going to add the two together. Color plus equals result of one. This isn't supposed to make any sense. Just kind of show you guys what the, some of the stuff you can do here. So I've added it together. I've got this ridiculous texture in its place because I haven't actually defined what it should be yet. You notice when I go to my render pipeline editor, it's red, so it's telling me I need to define pass input texture one. I'm going to tell it to use Quake. And now you'll see when I hit fly through, the end result is something really cool. The main rendering pass essentially leaves the um, the surface still and the post-processing effect causes an oscillation and the two effects of the two, two, two uh, scene rendering passes are combined together in my post-processing effect, in my post-processing shader. And what I can do here is I combine these any way I see fit. I can subtract them, I can multiply them, essentially can do whatever I want. So that's basically the gist of post-processing effects and how you can do uh, some really neat effects with them. So while we're on the subject, there's just one more 
concept or thing I'd like to talk about when it comes to multi-pass rendering techniques. So as you guys remember, um, when you perform a render pass that does, goes anywhere except the screen, it is rendered to the texture for later use. And that texture can be used as input into another rendering pass. However, what I didn't really cover or mention was that that texture can be used in other places as well. Um, so let me show you guys how something like that might work. Here's our little uh, gas station. A petrol station is the, the British call it. And I'm going to go ahead and get rid of some of this stuff and kind of start us back to default here. So we have our gas station and what we would like to do essentially is render it to a texture by adding a scene rendering pass, which is exactly what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something a little weird here. I'm going to actually take the rendering pass and I'm going to render it from a completely different perspective. Now Virto Studio doesn't currently yet support multiple cameras, but I can kind of emulate that technique by pulling this crazy little idea off of mine. So for starters, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up that shader I had before, which was called Shift, and I'm just going to make it work with lighting just to make it make more sense. Okay. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to take this special shader called Shift, and I'd actually would like it to render as if the model view projection matrix, which represents the combination of the uh, model transform, um, which positions the uh, 3D object, and the view transform, which essentially is the camera, and I'd like to take that and make my own. And the way I'm going to pull that off is I'm basically... I'm basically going to take this shift shader and just like I did before, I'm going to set it as the override shader for the scene pass. Done. And I'm going to create a post processing pass here. And this is basically for the sake of debugging so that I can see my scene pass easily. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make a second uniform pass input texture. I'm going to do another color just like before. This time, when I mix the two together, I'm going to basically look at only the second one because that's the one I'm interested in. Now, of course, like I said, once you add a second pass input, you have to hook the input up using the um, system like so. So now we're basically looking exclusively at the... Um, uh, the second rendering pass you know, uh, scene pass. And I'm basically going to call this um, scene pass is fine, actually. I'll leave that unrenamed. Um, so here's how we're going to pull off the uh, interesting effect. Basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit this shader. And you'll notice the transform is the default model view projection matrix. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to take just the model matrix Just apply that and make my own basically MVP model view projection matrix myself. And that's going to start out by first applying the model matrix, and then that's going to be multiplied by some camera transform that I'm going to define here or attempt to. And um, it's going to use just that. And we're going to start the camera transform as the identity, as just a placeholder. Now this doesn't look too good yet, and that's probably because um, I have not applied uh, any fancy stuff inside the camera transform yet. That or I just completely screwed this up and nothing's going to work right, but I really hope that's not the case today. So uh, the first thing I'd like to do um, to make sure that this stuff is going to work properly is basically set up my camera transform. And I'm going to do this just with translations because rotations is not the kind of thing I want to hand code right now. So I'm basically going to make a real quick gen translate um, method. It tells me this isn't going to go very well um, doing this by hand, but I'll do the best I can. I might even, yeah. 
So we got the 0, 1, 2, last column would be 3. And we're going to set that equal to delta and then 1.0. And that should generate a translation matrix. So now if I say the camera transform is equal to translation matrix that does a translation. Now the trick with the camera matrix, I don't want to get too into this theory right now, but basically anything that you would do to the model, you do the opposite if you're, if you're moving the camera. So anything you would do to move the, translate the camera, you do the opposite transform. And that kind of has to do with um, relativity between two objects. So if I want to move the camera away from the uh, from the objects, and I'm looking down the negative z axis, then I should be able to apply um, a negative offset. Oh, I did something quite stupid, guys. Um, I can't just apply the camera transform and the model matrix. The p part is the projection. I have to have the projection matrix, or this won't work. So that's easy. I just define that system uniform. It's set for the system by me, and it's the model matrix first, then the camera transform, and then the projection transform. And we can basically start to see something, and now I can define essentially my camera transformation to position my second camera wherever I want to manually. So, like I said, to move the camera down, I'm still dialing this in here. And clearly, I'm really bad at this um, by hand. Um, I'm trying to get above the snow if I can. And it seems the right way to do this is to go negative. There we go. So to move the camera up, uh, I basically have to perform a translation or a transformation that will move it the opposite direction for the rest of the scene. So for example to go up I um, subtract and to go down I uh, add to the negative numbers. So basically what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to take this and I'm going to position it inside the shop I guess because that's the simplest thing I can think to do right now. So I'm just going to kind of trial and error my way over to here I'm going to affect the z-axis alright so that's basically inside the shop now I have my transformation set up for my second pass with a manual camera and what you can see here is that if I wanted to I can mix them together which is not what I'm going for for this specific effect what I would like to do instead is use the second texture in my scene. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this off the utilization of this pass and my debugging. I was trying to figure out why this was happening. It's because I have this set manually for this particular shader and I don't want to do that anymore. All right, so where does all of this long stuff get me? Well, basically, like I said, I can use this pass as a texture anywhere I want and basically make a portal, or what would look like a portal, in my scene. So I just generated a new plane. And I'm going to move that to somewhere where I can see it. And since my rendering is a texture map, I can just apply it directly to this plane and essentially generate a portal. So I'm going to go ahead and pick a texture here. Now you'll notice I can't pick it as a standard texture map because it's not part of the, uh, the built-in texture mechanism. But if I create a shader just called texture, and all it does is apply a texture map, and I switch out texture 0 for something called custom texture, I can now define custom texture to be essentially a pass render output. And now what you're seeing here is basically the live rendering 
of the other pass injected directly into the scene. And if you don't believe that this is dynamic, I can go back to that shader that I have set, which is the override shader, and I can animate it. There we go. So now it's actually moving. And I could make it animate back and forth if I really wanted to by just doing a sine wave, which is something I commonly like to do. So that's an example of rendering or using a scene is using a, a scene rendering or another render pass directly in your main scene. Now as you guys could probably guess, you can do some really interesting stuff with this. Even though it's not built into Virto Studio yet you can actually implement procedural texturing um, render pass type, but basically what you can do here is you can render out a custom procedural texture, and you can imagine the power here when you can do something like this. I mean, you could actually render directly to custom texture maps, such as normal maps or parallax displacement maps, and you can actually procedurally generate bumps or ripples or anything you imagine you can want to, um, which is, is extremely cool. So uh, an example of maybe something like that would be if I took the geofrag chord dot x geofrag chord dot y just did some quick divisions and if I was to use now post effects pass, or I'll just call this procedural texture. If I was to use that instead of my scene pass as uh, my texture map, you can see that basically I would have, I can't spell the word procedural. I have a procedurally rendered texture here, and I can animate this based off of time. So you can see the uh, possibilities here are essentially endless. So um, that's essentially as much as I'm going to get into it for this video, but that is multi-pass rendering. And uh, it's really amazing some of the stuff you can pull off with these techniques. So um, that's basically the video. Thanks for watching, guys.